Right, well, welcome along, everyone, to another edition of South Pacific Muscle. This is a, um, an interview that I'm very, very excited. We've, we've raised the bar of the intellectual standard here today because for the first time, we've actually got a published author as uh, our guest, the guy who also played a little bit of rugby. He's a little bit like New Zealand's answer to Peter Fitzsimons, except I think Fitzsimons played a little bit of rugby and published a hell of a lot more books, um, one of which I'm actually reading at the moment. But um, I want to introduce our, our very special guest today, uh, a guy that for, for anyone who hasn't been living under a rock probably needs no introduction, but he's all black number 1094. Um, you know, he was actually born not long after the very first all black World Cup win in 1987, standing 185 centimetres or six foot one, 122 kilos and a Rugby World Cup uh, gold medal winner. Um, Mr. Owen Franks, what? how are you Just going today, Owen? Yeah, good. I'm not sure about <laughs> race, the uh, intellectual bar, but um, no, happy <laughs> to be here and, and happy to be on the podcast to talk some training. Yeah. Well, you've published more books than Mike and I combined, and I think that is one, if I remember. And this is really the reason we wanted to get you on. I know you probably talk rugby till till your cauliflower ears are falling off with people, and um, yeah, we we love the game, but I was one of the, I guess, my more articulate rugby players in my time, I stood on the wing. Um, Mike is a is a highly proficient coach to a very high level. I think is it seven under or eight 12s, years I think right now? Under twelve. Yep. Under twelve now. <laughs> so you're moving up. I'm so, sorry. Yeah. Junior that, coaches. That, that's pretty much our our level of um, of I guess credibility when it comes to the game of rugby. But we're a pair of lugheads who like to to lift heavy things, and and we thought, well, you're. You are well known as as an absolutely elite trainer um, within the sport. I know um, that when you recommend something, other All Blacks follow suit. And I know through personal experience with my business, I've seen that that happen. So I guess, if, you know, we're, we're going to talk a bit about your training and such later on. But just to give a bit of context to people, you know, some of our, our parents and our grandparents um, will say, you know, talk about the old days when, when all blacks didn't train in the gym and they were farmers and they were big and they were tough. And I did a little research and I looked up very, very famous all black prop farmer um, or agricultural worker, Wilson Winneray, 183 centimeters. So um, he got you by, uh, no, he was almost your height, Owen, but he, he, he came in at a cracking 94 kilos. Now, um, you know, I competed in bodybuilding at about 94 kilos so in context, you're 122 kilos. The reality is guys lifting heavy weights to, to bang into other guys who lift heavy weights, you know, you, you couldn't cut the mustard this day and age if you weren't going to the gym and doing all that. And so that's really what we wanted to, um, to talk to you about. So um, at this yep. point, I want, to, I want to hand over to Mike because I know that Mike's got more than a few questions as a, as a qualified PE instructor. So uh, Mike, yep. jump in. What, what are your thoughts? Oh look, I'm. I want to go right from right from the start to, to finish. So, give us a bit of a rundown on you know your early days as a as an athlete. What were you naturally good at? Um, you know, how did you kind of evolve into into lifting? Uh, and you know, what was your transition into rugby early on? Yeah, I suppose what I was good at earlier on. Uh, say the things that have served me well. Uh, you know, even now. I'd, the ability to work, um, you know, even though I know a lot about training when I was young, I remember going for runs uh, as soon as I can remember, really, you know, five, six years old, growing up in Littleton, uh, me and my friend would get up before school, um, you know, 6, 6.30, run down to the park and run back. And I just always had that drive uh, watching All Blacks games that, you know, I really had no right to because it didn't have a hell of a lot of talent, but I just, there's always something in the back of my head that thought I could do that. Um, so I suppose that work ethic served me well. Definitely the physicality. You know, I remember playing rugby when I was younger. Um, same friend, and, and we would have competitions. <laughs> it's not very, um, not very PC now, but it was. You know, we'd have competitions around who could dump truck, which was to spear someone pretty much on the head <laughs> the most in a game. You know, so it was just that physicality side of the game. I, I, I used to love. Um, and then as I got older, it became apparent that, you know, if I wanted to make a job of it, 
or you know wanted to reach the highest level I was going to have to put in the extra work because you know I didn't have an abundance of talent I wasn't physically that gifted um I think it was around 14 or 15 where we made the con conscious decision, me and my brother, with old man, to uh, really start training. And, and that was when, uh, it was one birthday, probably my first gym membership. Um, and, and started from there, really. You know, I just always had in the back of my mind that I was going to have to do more and, and do extra to, to um, catch up and and, and uh, surpass some of these guys, you know, with the, with the, physical, with the physical gifts. There was a, a, I found a newspaper article that, uh, and I'll quote from it. Actually, he'd never previously been much of a footballer, full stop. More of a strong man with enough mobility and agility to give rugby a decent crack. So, uh, you know, you, you turn that on its head uh, with 108 caps, the All Blacks, you're obviously one of the best uh, to ever play the game. But clearly, strength training uh, was a focal uh, point from really early on. Uh, but you must have, I guess, had the physical makeup to kind of work well with it because I got myself to 130 kilos in bodybuilding and then tried to play rugby and uh it was oh, it was awful and they put me in the front row because I was big and strong and I got my head shoved up my ass every scrum and I had no clue what was going on I just got broken I was a small guy who yeah. built myself up clearly you're a big strong man who's also hit the gym really hard as well so you know how does that yeah. so how does that sort of work as you as you grew older I mean your brother was four years older and you uh, would have yep. got him competing with him. And, and, and what sort of lifts were you doing early on? How did that sort of work? Yeah, so, you know, I was similar, really. I wasn't, you know, I suppose I've got a, a reasonable size frame, but there was a period of three or four years, probably from 16 to 17, up until about uh, maybe 20, where I'd put on 10 plus kilos of preseason, you know, like, um, lifting before school four or five days a week, you know, on the school holidays, um, working and, and lifting around that and, and just eating an enormous amount of food. You know, I always struggle when um, rugby players or or people, you know, so-called hard gainers and they say, you know, I just can't eat enough. And, you know, I've, I've been through that. And I'm, I'm sure you guys have as well. We're eating six, seven times a day and, you know, you feel sick eating, but like that's, that's eating to put on weight, not, you know, these guys eating three meals and they're sick of it or they're too lazy to food prep. And, um, you know, I was doing that. I was doing all that for a solid, uh, up until I was about 21. And then I could start to um, get, consolidate that weight. But, uh, yeah, what was, the, what was the other part of the question? Well, so, I mean, this is actually pretty relevant for me. I'm a high school PE teacher. And, and at my yeah. gym, there's a, um, there's a group of probably, I don't know, anywhere between sort of five and 15 guys that are ostensibly rugby players, but they're loving their gym work. Yeah. And uh, yeah. I see them, you know, benching and doing curls and they're trying to oh, do yeah. one of their maxes to sort of, you know, show how strong they are at 16, 17 years old. So, you know, what sort of training did you do? I mean, what was the balance between functional yeah. training and powerlifting in the early days? And then sort of get on to what you did sort of at the elite level as well. Yep, well, um, yeah, my start was with, I mentioned before, with Warren Thin, who was, I want to say, eight or nine-time um, New Zealand senior bodybuilding champion. I'm, I'm sure you guys... Um, eight. Eight, eight. Yeah, eight. Yeah. <laughs> and, um, yeah, so my dad introduced uh, me to him when I was 14. And, you know, super basic stuff. Um, you know, with the bar, squat, deadlift, um, curls, you know, all, all the basics of lifting, but it was it was high reps, perfect technique. You know, gave give me good advice around um, nutrition. I was, you know, I was overweight as a 13, 14 year old, you know, like a skinny fat. And um, he gave me really good advice around eating, really simple from the start, you know, make sure you finish all your milk and, and your cereal and things like that. And slowly we cut out all the crap I was eating and really leaned up and then, and then sort of worked from there. So my start in weight training was uh, just basic bodybuilding really. And then I want to say when I was 16, um, got introduced to Lee Attrell, who's Olympic weightlifting coach in Christchurch and really started to get into the Olympic weightlifting side of things. Um, and same thing, basics, you know, I remember um, spending a, a session with him, me and my brother just doing squats um set after set you know five reps but the, the technique had to be perfect you know just putting the time in so it was at that age it was never about lifting heavy it was always technique you know with warren it was working the muscle um and then it was probably about 18 19 20 where i could really start lifting those um 
those big weights. But I, I had a nice balance because there'd be a part of the year I'd spend with Warren where we'd really, um, I suppose, put in the work of getting that strength base up. And then I'd go spend time with Lee where we're, we're turning that muscle into athletic muscle and, and, and hitting some big cleans, some snatches, um, you know, squats and things like that. So, you know, for a few years, years there, um, that was a really good balance for me, you know, put, put the time on with Warren and then, uh, and then turn it into, yeah, like I said, ath- athletic muscle for rugby. I um, just have a quick question. I, I, I did a session with Richie Patterson, who's a gold medal um, Olympic lifter for New Zealand at the Com Games, and I think he might be the head of New Zealand weightlifting. So I, I can empathise. I, I did a squat session with him. Just one, I don't think the weight got above 60 kilos, and I, I literally couldn't get off the couch for three hours afterwards. So, so I empathise yeah. with that. Um, I am curious though, with a lot of that that Olympic that yeah that technique that overhead lifting, did you find there was a a correlation between that and say particularly around your shoulder girdle and and the rucking and the scrummaging and and so forth strengthen that sort of that upper area because you've got your hand in that extended overhead position, which is normally a little bit unsafe. Did, did that help you? I think it did in terms of not so much overhead because I always struggled with that. You know, playing rugby my whole life, and even by 19, 20, my shoulders were pretty pretty sloppy to be honest. I used to have a lot of um, I think it's called sub subluxation when it comes in and out. And overhead strength was never a uh, never a strength of mine. Um, but one thing that really did help was the Olympic lifting because it's so technical. It's that mind muscle. You know, you don't have time to feel the weight. It's just you've got to. A bit like scrummaging, you um, you line up, you're going through your process, your steps, and then you've just got to commit to it. And um, find that had really good correlation for scrummaging, which which is why I like it. The heavy cleans, the front squats, the trunk work, um, yeah, Olympic lifting back squats. Uh, that that's why I really like it. And I think in tackling as well, when you can um, you know brace your core and really drive into impact. Um, that, that's where I really noticed the difference of, of Olympic weightlifting to rugby. But um, in terms of, no, it's, it, it's a hard one in season as well, the Olympic lifting um, to do consistently just because your shoulders get banged up a lot and, you know, your back and things like that. So that's one thing I found a little hard with Olympic weightlifting was just the consistency of it in season when you're taking bangs um, from the contact. Did you bring in uh, sort of multi-directional movement, diagonal bounding, sort of uh, rotational work as well early on? Or was that something that sort of came later when you got to that elite level and, and got under the uh, strength and conditioning coaches with the professional teams? No, I definitely did early on. That's one thing that's, um, I think people just see me as a meathead who just lifted weights and and that was my lot. But, you know, from that 15, 16, um, my dad would download like college linebacker, um, pre-season programs so we used to do a shit ton of agility work and, and that was our conditioning really you know we'd do agility work short sprints 20 30 yard sprints um all that stuff we're doing ball handling you know i could pass both ways when i was freaking geez i don't know seven or eight um <laughs> i used to kick goals when i was younger so you know though i'm although i'm probably seeing now is just a scrummager and, and a lifter you know i really um when I wanted to become a professional, I really wanted to be a multi-skilled prop, not not just the guy that could that could scrum. So I've always been pretty proficient in those areas. But um, yeah, in terms of the agility work, you know, I just had I had to do that stuff because, like I said, I wasn't that athletically gifted, so I just had to work super hard. Yeah, nice. Um, so there's a there's a young man at my gym who's freakishly strong. He's a prop. Shout out uh, to Cam. Um, he'll he'll watch this, no doubt. Um, really, really strong, lots of good functional strength, you know, one arm snatches, sort of, you know, one arm long barbell curls, that sort of thing. Um, overhead presses, I've seen him do. Um, sorry, you were about to um, repeat that, it just um, sound just cut out. That's right, we can right. Hear um, it. yeah. So, a, a, young, <laughs> a young man at my gym who you know has got us cut in the same mold as you, he's been training with a trainer since he's about 12. Great functional strength, freakishly strong. He did some powerlifting. I saw him in there doing yep. um, overhead presses. He was doing, uh, sorry, overhead squats. He was doing singles. And it was the day before a sevens tournament. And I said to him, what are you, you know, what are you in here lifting heavy like that for? And, um, and he said, well, I don't, it doesn't break down my muscles and it doesn't give me any metabolic stress. So I can fit that in on a Friday before I play a sevens tournament. 
So in what ways would your uh, training kind of be sort of uh, counterintuitive to someone like us? Uh, you know, where would you fit different things in that sort of seem would be strange to us as bodybuilders who tend to break down the muscles every time we train and then try and let them recover? Yeah, exactly. Um, yeah, well, I suppose the structure of my normal week, or how I've always done it is, um, you know, Monday would be my heavy lower, heavy lower body session where I'd, you know, hitting doubles, triples on, on a back squat, um, power cleans, um, similar sort of thing. Um, yeah, he heavy lower body work. Tuesday is my upper day. Um, same thing, gonna have my, my key lifts and some and some heavy singles, doubles, but also, you know, for my upper body, uh, I had a lot more volume in, in my accessory work. You know, and, and just like I said before with uh, Warren, that's sort of like my armor building. You know, I do a lot of arm work, shoulders, um, trying to put, keep muscle on those areas um, that's going to help me in contact at rugby. Um, Thursday would be um, like a full body power. I'm trying to move things fast, but not necessarily light, still maybe around 70, 80%, but, you know, trying to get some good bar speed. And then... Uh, Typically Friday off, and you know I've always done a primer on game day. Where depending on how I feel, I might um, yeah might, might build up a squat, or if I don't feel like lifting, um, you know just do body weight movement, but try and move it fast. But just something to wake up really, especially when you're playing those seven thirty seven thirty at night type type games. So, so what's the you know, rough percentage breakdown of sort of strength, power, you know, uh, resistance work versus, you know, cardiovascular versus sort of mobility um, versus any other sort of skill-based training that you've got? How, how would that sort of break down as a percentage basis over your week? I'm not sure off the top of my head. I mean, the conditioning, you get a lot during training, especially the way we train for rugby now where uh, – you know, the way rugby's gone, like most teams, the Thursday training is almost like game speed and a half. So you're doing things at a really high tempo. Tuesday will be a little bit slower, but maybe longer time on grass. Um, Monday, sometimes people will get a conditioning hidden it, you know, like a short, short Metcon type, type workout. Um, but for me, it's uh, when I'm in the gym. I, I just want to. I just want to focus on that. Whether I'm hitting my strength work or uh, my body burn. I don't want to chuck too much stuff in because you just. I find you end up going, you know, heaps of everything and not really nailing what the purpose of the session is. So, uh, you know, like my Monday, my Monday session where it's put on my strength. You know, I'm just focusing on that Tuesday as well with a, with a bit of bodybuilding from my upper. And you can go back um, yeah, that, later in the day to do a cardio session as well or or go out for a run or do sprints on those days as well? I don't think so because, uh, yeah, like I said, like Tuesday's a big, usually a big field session where you get those short repeated efforts in. Um, you know, you've got your scrummaging work in there on top of that. So I just think, uh, to be honest, like modern S&C, sports science, there's so much information, but I think the lacking... A little bit of common sense around those things you know some people go in do a heap of mobility uh they've got their weights a metcon circuit then you've got your field training and it's just it's a lot of stuff and it's like it, you know you can't recover from all that especially um especially as a you know as an old athlete i'm in my 30s now so i've got to be really smart around uh, mm. you know how much i tap into the well and, and how much i can recover from so yeah, like I said, you know, um, sometimes these S and C guys are going to chuck in a speed session, uh, this and that, you know, conditioning in the gym. But if you look at our field training, you're getting a lot of that in, in the field training, especially if you push yourself hard enough, you know. And then, and then you've got to think about you've got a game on Saturday. We it's uh, it's max effort day, really. That's the way I've always looked at it. No matter how I'm feeling, I've got to give maximum effort. Um, you know, throw my body into everything. You've got to be mentally up for that. Um, so you know you're tapping into that well during the week. You're not quite recovered on the weekend. It, it, you know you get those days where you wake up and you're just not feeling it. Where you know I want to make sure I get the Saturday and I know I'm in prime condition to friggin' you know 
throwing my body at other humans. <laughs> do you guys, what do you do around recovery? Um, I, I had a little bit of a play last year using the ice bath technology and, um, and that was painful. Do you have any specialized programs, routines, um, strategies or techniques around that? Um, I wouldn't say specialized routines, but they do give information on, on, on what are some good things. Um, yeah, I've always enjoyed cold water, but then there's that, um, I suppose there's that information now, now that, you know, your, your dull adaption, you know, so, so if, you, if you want adaption from training, then you had a really hot, cold ice bath that can kind of hurt that. But if, if we were doing a, a double day training, I would definitely have an ice bath in between just to, just to freshen up, really. But the heavy hitters for me have always been massage is definitely the biggest one I noticed. Sauna I really like, um, as long as it's put in on the right day. Um, I think sauna can be hard if you've had two hard trainings in a day and then you had a sauna at night. It just feels like, for me, you're sort of taxing your body a bit too much. You know, pool work, uh, I, I just think all the basics, um, nutrition, sleeping, obviously the big ones. But yeah, I'd say sauna, massage, uh, uh, the big ones for me. Now you mentioned being in your thirties. Now, have you have you changed the, your philosophy or the way you train now from when you're in your early twenties uh, with respect to sort of recovery or, or any of those other aspects? Do you train smarter now rather than harder, or is it just the same as it's always been? I think a little bit smarter. Yeah, I think what works for me at the minute is um, with my lifting. Like I like warming up really well because I have to. You know, hit my my rehab, there's always a few things I've got to keep ticking away on, you know, like neck, shoulder, and calf. Um, and once I'm really warm, I actually like to, you know, get to my top set that I'm trying to hit for that day pretty quick, but but hit it hard and heavy. So, you know, like heavy doubles, singles, or, you know, even if I'm going to hit, hit, hit a heavy triple for that day, but I'm not going to spend a whole heap of sets getting up to that weight, then I might hit a a lighter back down set to get um, get a little bit of volume in there, but I suppose um, yeah, I suppose that's it. Really, spending less time getting really warm, but spending less time um, working up and just hitting a really hard, you know, max effort set for the day. Where what I'm trying to hit, and then making sure I'm not in the gym too long. Really, you know, yeah, just. Is, just point out what you said earlier for the, for the younger lifters that you were a high reps in technique when you were uh, in your teen years. So what you're doing now is, is the fact that you've got fairly well ingrained movement patterns, been at it for 20 years now. So for those younger lifters that will be watching, you know, it's technique and it's higher repetitions. Yeah, exactly. And my training's age, my training age has allowed me to do that. You know, I think um, if you haven't put on the work and you think I'm going to quickly build up to a max effort set and, you know, you're sort of maybe asking for an injury, but yeah, I've, I've been able to do that pretty well. So I meant to sort of uh, ask you this earlier on, but have you got any particular lifts? Because, you know, we've, we've got bodybuilders and powerlifters watching us. So what any particular lifts over the years that you're very proud of? Any sort of, you know, max weights for reps or uh, anything that's particularly or that you, you're really proud of? Yeah, I think a couple spring to mind. They're all lower base, like my, <laughs> my bench pressing up has always been, yeah, you know, it's always been hard work for me. But um, a couple with Warren and one with Lee. Um, I had a 280 squat with Warren training at Les Mills when I was 21. Um, <laughs> that was with knee wraps and a, and a belt, but um, yeah, I'll still take it. And I think the reason I had that, uh, Warren, you know, just had a real um, old school mentality lifting. You know, he would he would put weight on without asking, and you'd be questioning yourself, like, "Fuck, can I lift this?" And he said, "You're lifting it." You know, it just <laughs> our, our trainings with him were hard and heavy. You know, I don't think I could have done it all year round. It was certainly, uh, you know, once a once a year type deal because it was it was friggin' tough training. But uh, yeah, so I had the two eighty squat with Warren, uh, one sixty five block clean with Lee for a double. Um, that, that was a lift I was really proud of. And then I was in 2018, I was coming back from an Achilles surgery and training with Warren again. And uh, we just wanted to do something a little little bit different, you know, just to stay, I suppose, um, <laughs> mentally stimulated. And um, 
So we trained for a 20 rep squat and then the goal was to hit 180 for 20 reps. Ooh. And we started out, um, <laughs> yeah, the way we did it was we did 10 sets of two at 180 and the rest periods when we started, I think were maybe a minute 30. We got that over a period of, I don't know, two or three months, we got that rest period down to about 15 seconds. And then we hit the 20 reps and <laughs> it oh. was hands down the hardest. Yeah. It's the hardest thing I've done in terms of training. Um, it's funny, I, should, I wish I had the video. I don't know where it's gone, but I got to about 10 reps and I was like, there's no way I can complete this. And, uh, you know, I managed to guts it out, the, the 20 reps, absolutely trashed. And um, when I look back on the video, like the, the bar speed actually never changed. Mm. You know, it always flew up really easy, but it was just the the conditioning aspect of it was brutal. Like, you know, I'm on the verge of stewing up type stuff. But um, there's, there's not a lot yeah, worse than a 20 rep squat. <laughs> no, <laughs> no. So that three, uh, three lifts I'm really proud of. Yeah, fantastic, fantastic. You, you mentioned um, your Achilles injury in 2018. I know you just went through that again. What was some of the um, rehab or prehab or recovery stuff that you've had to to do around that? Yes, yeah, so I've been through two Achilles rehab uh, uh, injuries now. Um, I suppose the big one for a start is um, learning to walk again. It's a tough thing, getting your gait right. And then, um, to be honest, I just treat it like any other part of your body. You're trying to get stronger, you know. You start out with, uh, you know, light reps or what you can do, and you slowly build it up with, with heavier weight over time, and that, that seemed to work. Um, heavy sled pushes really worked with me for my Achilles rehab. Um, the second time around, did a lot more work in the pool earlier on. Like I was actually walking really quick. Like I, I don't know what the doctors said, but I was, I was out of the boot pretty quick, just walking around the house and mm. um, you know just feeling it really. And um, I think I was running on eight, two months post surgery, just jogging. You know, not anything too explosive. Um, but I think that uh, yeah, that's helped with my rehab. You know, taking what the, the doctors and surgeons are saying with a grain of salt and just always pushing that little bit and seeing how far you can push it. Sometimes you push it a bit far and you know to back off and and just, uh, yeah, you're doing things that way and having a good physio who can, um, you know, who's not too conservative has is, is helped with me both times. Now, um, sort of to move on to a little bit of a, a I guess, a different subject, you, you've talked already about um, obviously Warren and for, for those who've only been around for maybe the past two decades in, in, in the gym in New Zealand, as, as we said before, Warren's an eight time Mr. New Zealand winner. If there was to be a, um, a hall of fame for bodybuilding in New Zealand, um, he'd have to be one of the first names mentioned, completely dominated the sport in the eighties, um, went to numerous uh, Mr. Universal world champs um, right through to the early nineties and just, yeah, was an absolute brick. Um, but I, I know that you've worked with other guys like um, Kevin Toonan at, um, at Strength Lead over there. And, and oh. Yeah, sorry. <laughs> that's all right. <laughs> uh, over there in, in Sydney. And, um, you know, uh, who, if I remember rightly, um, uh, Offatunga Farsi's also worked with them. How do you uh, connect, connect up with guys like that? And, um, Get in, uh, get in touch. What's the benefit of going over there? Um, you seem to be a bit of a leader in regards with that of of taking um, external advice and training and and applying it to your game. Yeah, I think I've I've just always been open minded, and I suppose uh, um, every year, um, every preseason, I've always really looked forward to seeing you know you have your basics that you stick you stick to your training principles but what can I do a little bit different and I've just always met the right sort of people at the right time I met Kev um, over in Perth actually with the Crusaders uh, we were training out of a gym there and he was involved with um, Australian SAS at the time in a, in a training capacity um, he's also served with them and we just got talking training. I think we actually had a little argument. We we're talking about Olympic lifting versus, um, you know, he's from like a conjugate um, Louis Simmons type background with his training. And we just uh, traded emails over time, you know, developed a friendship. And then 
you know, um, every time we got over to Sydney, I'd, I'd catch up with him. And then it turned out into, you know, he was doing some programming for me. And, um, you know, just the hallmarks of a, of a of a good strength coach that you meet. You know, he's put his time on himself in the gym, but he's also got the, uh, you know, he's also studied all the right things at, at university. And he's just an incredibly smart guy with a, with a, with a lot of knowledge. And, um, yeah, his, his training for me worked, worked really well um, as well. You know, opened up my eyes to a few things um, and, and made some great gains with him. So, yeah, he, for anyone out there who's, who's looking for a strength and conditioning program for sport, combat sport, or for anything, he's um, he's really good trainer. How, did, how does it correlate? Um, you know, in our mindset, it's normally doing cardio work is going to strip muscle down. Um, you know, running releases a hormone that breaks down muscle tissue. And so we, we stay away from it. Uh, the, at the most, we might do some some steady state, you know, low intensity. But you know, you guys have got to run for eighty minutes. How do you correlate putting on you know size and putting on um, fitness at the same time? It's it seems like an oxymoron to us. Yeah, well, I think you can. Um, to be honest, if I had my time again, I'll I'll run a lot less because, like you said, it's for me, it's the hardest thing on my body. You know, I've, I've only ever got injured when I've had to do long distance type running that these um, strength and conditioning coaches, you know, get you doing. And it's just not specialized for a front rower, you know, I'm 120 kilos and I've got me doing the same running as, you know, like an open side flank or, or a winger. Just yeah. doesn't make sense. Um, and, you know, going back to training with Warren, we would do a lot of, you know, those trainings were, were friggin' hard. You know, like some, some of the, most mentally tough trainings I've had to get through because we'd do a lot of superset. He would say set for set. And he'd start off with six rounds, but sometimes it would go 12 and he wouldn't let you know when it's finishing with, with not much rest, you know. Um, and so, you know, your heart rate's pushing up near 80, 90% while, while we're doing our strength training. Um, and if I had my time again, I would just do that and I would hit some short sprint work, um, you know, maybe some short shuttles, keep my agility work up and I'd, I'd get my conditioning that way. Um, I wouldn't bother with the long distance stuff because it's only ever given me injuries. You know, the first time I injured my Achilles, I had a straight uh, S and C coach at the Crusaders getting me doing a 500 meter interval. Um, yeah, it's just not realistic for rugby either. If you look at a prop, um, the longest we sprint in a row would probably be off a kickoff. Uh, aside from that, it's short, sharp shuttles, getting off the ground quickly, um, lots of agility around the ruck. Um, so I'd get that balance a, a lot better, which is kind of what I'm doing now. You know, I've, I've got, I'm going to hit two speed sessions a week, focusing off my, my speed off the line, my agility work, and, and I can get my conditioning and, and uh, you know, during my weight training as well with, with how hard I push. Um, so, yeah, I'm not sure if that answers the question. but Yeah, yeah, uh, it certainly does. And, and I noticed because obviously yeah. you went, I think it was to, to Northampton, was it? Um, yep. Which um, obviously famous for having been the club of the legendary Buck Shelford, Go North Harbour. Um, yep. <laughs> you know, back in the day. <laughs> yeah, so, um, well, he's a legend there, yeah. Oh, yeah, absolutely. It's, it's a shame you weren't ever able to... Yeah, it's a shame you weren't ever able to pull on the... Um, on the, the beautiful hibiscus. I, I keep trying to convince Liam oh, to go up and then play there too, but, um, you know, you yeah. can't win them all. So, um, you know, oh, exactly, yeah. but, um, you know, when you were up there, you, you, you partnered up with Chris Kemp and um, from, from uh, I think it's, what is it? Uh, I workout plan. And now you're doing some, some programming work with him. What's the difference between what- I saw Mark, you just cut out there again. Oh, sorry. Uh, can you hear me now? Hello, can you hear me? Yep, can hear you now. Sorry. There you go. Um, so, what's the difference between what um, what what Chris is is doing with you? And uh, just to check, are you guys seeing the same screen sharing that I'm sharing? Not seeing anything now. No. What about now? Hold on. I'll try this. Is that better? Yep. Now we got it. Yep. There you go. So, so what's the difference between what um, what you're doing with Chris versus what you're doing with Kevin versus what you do with the Crusaders or the All Blacks? Chris and Kevin are, um, are very similar. Another another good strength coach, Chris Kemp. Um, the, the difference with those two guys, as opposed to, yeah, I suppose, New Zealand strength and conditioning coaches in the rugby realm, is that they have their own experience lifting. You know, Chris Kemp's um, 
incredibly strong. You know, if you look on his Instagram, he's, I want to say he's just on 90 kilos and he's hitting 180 kilo bench presses for doubles, got a big deadlift squat. Um, so they have, the, they have their own lifting experience where I don't know whether it's here because they're understaffed a bit, but yeah, you know, these guys, they just don't have the same lifting experience. And and Kempe there, he's been working specifically with front rowers for 10 plus years um, in the championship over there, then with Northampton. Um, the difference over there is um, they've probably got four or five S&C coaches with a team and they each look after their own position group. Oh, wow. Whereas um, in New Zealand, you've got two for a whole team and one of those guys is looking after guys who are rehabbing as well. So um, yeah, that, look, to be honest, that's the biggest difference. Uh, more resource. Um, guys are only looking at a certain position, so the training's uh, a lot more specific and tailored. Um, yeah. Okay. Uh, yeah, that's a very, very fortunate position to be in, I guess, going to that. It kind of reminds me if you ever watched some of those uh, programs about American football teams, and they seem to have almost as many coaches as they do players. Um, but I guess, you know, what you've got to do is going to be somewhat different to what a halfback or 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 a winger or even a yeah, a lock forward is going to have to do. So you're going to require some different yep. different specialties there. Um, so, onto that, sort of, I guess, is a bit of a segue. You've um, you know, obviously, we talked about you published a book back in the day with your brother about training. So for for the younger viewers, um, a book is actually a binding of a whole bunch of pieces of paper, um, unlike the um, current scenario with Instagram and Facebook and social media where <laughs> as long as you've got a really good ass shot, you can get a whole lot of followers and then suddenly you're an expert. To publish a book, you actually had to be an expert. And I think at 108 tests, uh, it's fair to say Owen is, is, a, um, is, is an expert. And, you know, it was really exciting for me before I knew you to actually open the book in a, in a bookshop one day and read in the forward and your acknowledgement of Warren Thin being, you know, I'm a bodybuilder, Warren's a bodybuilder. Uh, so that was really, really exciting to see that. And I, I know um, my good mate, Mike Debenham, who, um, you know, has had a, had a lot of great things to say about you and watching you guys train like a, like a pair of animals back in the day down there in Christchurch. Um, so how did it come about that you were, you were writing a book and become a published author? I've got to ask that one. <laughs> Not sure about a published author. To be honest, it was at the time, I think, I don't know if that was um, post-2011 World Cup. And... Yeah, we got approached by these publishers and they wanted to do a story on me and Ben, uh, you know, the typical rugby autobiography. Um, and we weren't really into that. You know, we didn't feel like our story was special, special enough to share. But what we did want to acknowledge was, um, you know, the people who had helped us along the way, you know, in a, in a training sense, you know, Warren, I think Lee's in there, um, Scotty Hansen, who's, who's helped me hugely on the, on the rugby side of things. Um, so we just wanted to put it, it it's a, as you would have seen, it's a very basic training book, you know, it was sort of aimed at, um, you know, guys like us when we were starting around 13 or 14, what's some basic exercises and a little bit of advice around getting into your strength training journey. And, and that was the goal of the book, really, just to put some good basic information out there and, and acknowledge the people who had, um, you know, paved, paved the way for us. That's exciting. And you went from there, you went to um, to open Frank's brother's um, gym uh, down there in Rolleston, I think it was. Um, that's where I, I never met you, but I went in there and I introduced myself. I met your dad, Ken, and, and had yep. a bit of a uh, look through there one day. And I think you spread that. If I'm not mistaken, did I see that inside of some city fitness gyms around the place at one point too? I... It was in a city fitness in uh, Nelson and Wellington, yeah. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Yeah, very, very good, considering that such a large, internationally owned business for you to be partnered up. Um, Frank's Brothers is, is, is no longer around, if I remember rightly. But, um... No, it, it, it's not. You know, um, at the time, it was a way for us to open a gym. You know, CrossFit was very new on the scene. And we thought with the way that we had trained, you know, there might be some parallels there. Um, if we had our time again, I think we would have just opened a traditional gym but you know yeah. just the basic and and not being so caught up and trying to get members and and that sort of thing i think we were just a bit naive in terms of um you know the amount of work it takes to keep a gym open and 
you know, memberships and people treat it a little bit like a club and not like a business. Um, yeah. Yeah. So I think we're talking with Ben, you know, if we had our time again, we would have just opened a, a place for us, would have kept probably more authentic to the way we train mm. and wouldn't have been so worried about bringing people in. But, yeah. you know, we learned a lot. Um, yeah. <laughs> Don't you and, and and you you learn you learn from I wouldn't say your failures but you learn from from history because now you've gone into the ironback scrums and um, you know you launched a new venture which I I have seen um, the, the the machines shipped around the country um, if I, I saw one I think it was the Blues had one I'm pretty sure off Tunga Farsi's bought one um, yep. I know there's there's one at Recreate Performance down there in um, down there in Christchurch um, that Reese and Mon are using. And uh, I had a chat to, uh, to Mon about it and she actually tells me that it's really popular, not only with the, with the rugby guys, but also the ladies are using it too. Um, really good oh, for hitting awesome. your glutes. Yeah, really good for <laughs> hitting your yeah, glutes sure and such. And um, I know that your gym down there in Dunedin, Mike's getting a new fit out. It could be worth tapping Owen on the, um, on the shoulder and, and drawing <laughs> one of these. And you, you, I saw a video back, I think it was 2000 and, uh, 18, you were using a similar piece of equipment somewhere else. How did how did this come about? Is and and what's new and different about it? Yeah, so I first saw um, a scrum sled like that in 2015 um, during the World Cup. We trained at London Irish. They had one in the gym. So long story short, I took a bunch of photos of it, brought it to an engineer in Christchurch, Kashmir Engineering, and wanted one made a little bit bigger. A little bit heavier, which is the one I've still got in my garage. It takes up half the bloody garage. It's friggin at least half a ton. <laughs> That's huge. But um, so I basically wanted that made up. So during my preseason training, um, you know, I could keep you know, scrum ready. Basically, you know, it's all good hitting the the squats and the pulls, all the rest of it. But you know, how can I keep sharp scrummaging wise while still um, uh, you know, adding, adding to my strength training. So uh, that was what I did. Uh, went overseas. I actually left it in the Crusaders gym. So Jace Ryan was using it with his guys. Now, when I came back from overseas, I, I got it back and um, he threw out the idea of, you know, making a few for some of the other scrum coaches around the country for for their guys to use in the gym. And um, that's where it sort of started from, really. Now we're at the stage where, you know, we want to make really high quality scrum products. We've got the sled as well that we're pushing out there, but it's basically a tool, uh, like I said, to, you know, time on field is a premium in, in the rugby week. So what can we do in the gym that, you know, we that can improve our scrummaging and, and keep our scrum sharp? So the time that we use on the field is, um, is really high quality because typically the time you have on the field as a whole pack, it's not as an individual where you're working on things. So um, it's a tool basically to, to, to work on your scrummaging and your scrum technique, your scrum strength in the gym. Oh, excellent, excellent. And something a little bit, again, totally left field on, I pulled up um, uh, th this old picture and uh, sort of wanted to ask you, you know, I know um, back in the day the, the Warriors had a, um, a UFC guy and they had Kenny Rainsfield coming in and teaching them about wrestling and so forth and... Um, you know, so you've obviously done a bit of rolling around on the mat. Are you still doing that? And did, did it help or was it just um, something to try out? Or what's the situation there? Oh, no, it's helped, helped um, greatly. I was actually thinking I should have mentioned it before with the conditioning aspect because um, if I had my time again, this would be one thing um, that I'd... Well, not only is jiu-jitsu, is doing jiu-jitsu a great skill to have just as a human, I think, you know, in terms of being able to defend yourself and... And things like that. For rugby, it just goes hand in hand. You know that close quarter wrestling, the body contact, the mobility it requires, um, the conditioning aspects. It has um, there's so much that relates to rugby. You know, with tackling and, and the work around the ruck, and uh, it, it's helped me hugely, um, especially with getting off the ground quickly. You know, using your levers and and things like that. So yeah, no, I'm still doing it. I uh, did it yesterday. Actually, I'm going to go again tomorrow. Um, it's incredibly humbling as well, you know, because <laughs> you're getting, uh, you, you know, sometimes you get beaten up by guys almost half my size, you know, around mm -hmm. 70 or 80 kilos and just get stuck in a spider web and <laughs> you know, get dominated. So, you know, it's, it's just great learning a new skill as well. 
you know. But um, yeah, if, if I could, for any young front rower out there who's, uh, you know, starting training, wants to be wants to be a professional rugby player, I definitely recommend that. Some sort of you know wrestling, whether it's jujitsu or judo, something along those lines. It'll help teach you to cheat in the dark, dark spaces of of the ruck and the mall, you know. <laughs> Uh, a little bit easier That's in right. club level when there's not a hundred cameras on you, but um, <laughs> yeah. but maybe something for some of uh, your players might to uh, to look at. Yeah. In, any uh, any further thoughts, Mike, or any questions you might want to chime no, in? With? It's been pretty extensive. I've been really impressed. I've, I've got a you know, really way better understanding of uh, of the progression and and, uh, and how it all breaks down. So yeah, thanks very much for that. I appreciate your uh, insights. And despite oh, no, thanks for having me on. Uh, <laughs> Uh, sorry, uh, no, like I said, I was, uh, I was pumped to jump on here because, um, you know, I've always been a fan of bodybuilding. You know, um, I think there was one preseason of Ronnie Coleman, DVD came out, and I used to um, used to watch it before going to training. And I've uh, just always been a fan of the discipline that's requir required. I think people overlook, you know, how hard it is. You know, the small taste that I had with Warren um, was enough for me to think, you know, to do that at a professional level would be, yeah, it's not something I'd get into, but I've got a, I've got a, got a, got a lot of respect for it. So uh, thanks for having me on. Well, you know, uh, Jonah Lomu did a bodybuilding competition once upon a time. So um, I remember. Yeah. Yeah, and <laughs> yeah. Uh, if you look through it, Dennis James, who was an Olympia competitor, there's plenty of shots of him out there training, and he's wearing an All Black jumper too. So um, oh, awesome! You know, I'll look it up. Yeah, I think the respect probably goes both ways. But man, really, really appreciate your time today. Your insight. Your your experience is obviously exciting to hear about some of those lifts and, and being a bodybuilder, I'm just chuffed to hear the, the great words about, uh, about the legend that is Warren Thin. So, oh, and Frank's, uh, you know, All Black 1094. Thank you so much. And um, yeah, can't wait to see you hit the field again next year. Yep, got one, got another season with the Hurricanes and I'll, uh, I'll keep going as long as this body lets me. So, yeah. <laughs> we'll see where it takes it. Stop when you hit, the, when you hit East Coast Bays or Takapuna. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. That's right. Hello. Awesome. Wonderful. Hey, thanks, guys. Cheers. Have a great day. Thank you. Catch gotcha. you.